friends. We're always very happy to hear from mothers about their children and their reactions of children to our program. One story came to us this week from Denver. It seems that this child, under four years of age, was a bit impatient about being served his breakfast. And uh, he was banging his spoon on his bowl, demanding service. The mother was occupied and unable to do it. Finally, he picked up the bowl, pulled it over his head, and says, Look, Mom, Bishop Sheen. <laughs> we will probably get offers from a cereal company after that story, uh, but they can completely forget about it because it's nullified by another story which came to us from another boy under four from St. Paul, Minnesota. It seems as this particular boy was looking at the television on Tuesday evening, and finally we came on, and he shouted out, uh, Mom, here's Admiral Sheen. <laughs> well, I suppose we are on airwaves, and it was not so wrong. This little story is someone, is a story that you perhaps have already heard, but I am retelling it in order to illustrate the talk of this evening. It is apropos of an egotist who went to see his physician. He complained of pains in his head. And the doctor said to him, you feel a pressing pain here in the forehead? Yes, said the patient. And then a uh, rather throbbing pain in the back of the head, yes. And then piercing pains here at the side, yes. The doctor said, your halo's on too tight. <laughs> The point is that almost everybody today believes that he has a halo. If it doesn't come from virtue, at least it comes from shampoo. <laughs> everybody thinks they're an angel. There's only one angel on this program, and that's my angel. It's not I. Uh, Mark Twain once said, whenever I hear of the number of really disagreeable people whom I am told go to a better world, I'm thinking of changing the way I live. <laughs> that brings up those who believe they have halos. Oh yes, I must tell you a story about this. A father brought home his hat one night, and he said to his wife, I picked up the wrong hat in a restaurant. And his son looked at it, saw J.M.J., &J, and he says, that's Bishop Sheen's hat. <laughs> We're going to make a distinction tonight between nice people and awful people. The nice people always think they are good. The awful people know they are not. The nice people never do wrong. Never break a commandment. Never guilty of any moral infraction. If they do anything that we would call wrong, they have various ways of explaining it away. They say, well, it's due to economic circumstances. Some will say, I was born too rich. And others, I was born too poor. Someone else will say, and I was born with just enough. And the result is that they suffer from some kind of, of aberration, but never moral. Then others have the psychological complex. And uh, they explain it away in Freudian terms. And they say, well, I have an Oedipus complex, or an Electra complex, father complex, a mother complex. Now, the awful people, on the contrary, uh, they've never been rich enough to be psychoanalyzed. They just think they're plain bad. <laughs> they've never been introduced to their subconsciousness. And they interpret everything they do generally in terms of an infraction of a commandment. Now, nice people will be, for example, alcoholics. 
the awful people are drunkards. <laughs> Sometimes just plain bums. <laughs> The alcoholics never do anything wrong. They just have a disease. <laughs> uh, the drunkards and the bums, on the contrary, they say, oh, I'm a no good. They're fighting against passion, against weaknesses, and if they do anything good, they're like Philip Neary. They say, well, it was the grace of God. If they avoid anything evil, they say, as he did, when he saw a man to his death on the scaffold, well, except for the grace of God, there goes Philip Neary. <laughs> and... When these people, the nice people, do anything wrong, they always say, um, how stupid I was, or what a fool I was. And these people always say, what a sinner I am, how wretched I am. And the, the nice people always are conventions. Their morality is always the accepted morality of society at any, any given moment. If, for example, it is customary for society to have many divorces, well, they say, well, divorces are right. The awful people, on the contrary, never accept social morality. They do something wrong, they admit. The result is that the the nice people are always appealing to what everybody is doing. The awful people are generally below that level. The nice people think they're going straight because they're traveling in the best circles. And the awful people, their vices are rather open. Their sins are gross kind of a flagrant violation of law. There's a crudity. They lack that refinement that the very nice people have. And so we hear of a person who has broken almost every commandment, and it'll be said of her or him, but she's so nice, and he's so nice. And then these poor drunkards over here, oh, they're such awful bums. They're low. It's a peculiar thing about society that it has no place for those who are either too bad or too good. That is why on the hill of Calvary, we have our blessed Lord on the cross in the middle of two thieves. The two thieves were too bad for conventional morality. And our blessed Lord was too good. All that I have said, we could summarize in a few words. The nice people are very often the people who are not found out. And those awful people are the people that have been found out. I will tell you a story about some nice people and awful people. It happened after our blessed Lord had spent a night in prayer in the Garden of Olives, and he came to the temple. He came to the temple early in the morning, and inasmuch as it was a great feast, the Feast of the Tabernacles, and tens of thousands of people had gathered in the city, it was only natural, possibly, that there should be one or the other gross violation of morality. In any case, the very nice people, the scribes and the Pharisees, found a woman who had been guilty of committing adultery. And they dragged her into the temple. And they thrust her before our blessed Lord. She pulled the veil about her face to hide herself from her unabashed accusers. And they brought her to the attention of our Savior. 
not just because they were concerned about protecting the laws of morality, but because they wanted to catch him and ensnare him in his speech. And they tried to put him into a dilemma. And they said, The law of Moses commands that this woman be stoned to death. What sayest thou? Now it was true that the law of Moses did order the stoning of such a woman. You find suggestions of it in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. But that law was now a dead letter. Their intention in bringing it up was this. They were practically saying to our Savior, you say you come from God, that you are the Son of God? Well, the law of Moses comes from God. And if you come from God and the law of Moses comes from God, then order this woman stoned. Put her to death. That was only half the dilemma. For some decades, ever since the Romans had become master of that country, only the Romans had power over life. Therefore, the right to put anyone to death. So if he put that woman to death, they would report him to the procurator. They would condemn him of violating a law, a law against Caesar. So he was caught. If he stoned the woman in order to put to death, he was guilty of treason against Caesar. If he released the woman, he was guilty of heresy against Moses. And then the dilemma deepened too because they knew that he had been priding himself on his mercy and the fact that he came to forgive sins. So they were practically saying to him, if you condemn this woman, you're not merciful. If you do not condemn her, you're not just. In answer to their questions and their dilemma, our blessed Lord leaned forward. There was some dust on the temple floor. And he wrote. It was the only time in his life he ever wrote. What did he write? We know that he leaned over twice and scribbled something in the dust. We do not know what he wrote. Permit me to guess. And it's only a guess. Your guess is just as good as mine. I think that the first time that he leaned over, he wrote in the dust the sins of the woman. And a gentle breeze seemed to come up so suddenly, erase the writing. And as he wrote, they persisted in their question, what sayest thou about the law of Moses? And then he looked up at them, and he gave his answer. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. He was
was not abrogating the law of Moses. He was asking for a new jury. He was not doing away with the Mosaic dispensation. He was summoning new executioners. He was saying only the innocent have a right to condemn. And he, innocence itself, will not condemn her because he's going to die one day for her sin. When those nice people heard that, they looked to one another to see if anyone would be brave enough to say that he was not guilty of any sin. And then I think our Lord leaned over again and wrote. And as he began to write, they left one by one, beginning with the eldest. And I can picture about three of them remaining. And our blessed Lord looked up at one of them With one of those deep, penetrating looks that anticipate judgment. And then he leaned over. And he wrote in the dust, this time where there was no wind to blow the writing away. He wrote, thief. And he dropped his stone and hurried away. And then he looked at the second. And reading his soul as he had read Simon's soul at dinner. He leaned over and wrote in the dust for the second time the word murder and he dropped his stone and fled and there was only one left he was the youngest of all and the boldest. One of that group, when they came with stones, took one from his neighbor's hand, weighed it in his own to see which was the heavier one, give back the lighter one to the woman in order that he might throw the heavier one at the woman, giving the lighter one to his neighbor. And then our Lord looked into his soul and how he read it. And he wrote for the third time the word. Adulterer. And he dropped his stone quickly and fled. And there were left only two. Miseria and Misericordia. Misery, mercy, pitiableness, and pity. And he said to her, Woman, it was the title that he had given to his mother at Cana, and he would address her in the same way from the cross. Woman, where are they who accuse thee? She said, they are not here, my Lord. He said, then neither will I accuse thee. Go, sin no more. He was not making light of it. The reason he was not making light of it was because he would die for that sin. The result was that those who came were very, very nice 
and were convicted of their sins, left him without receiving pardon and absolution. And those awful people came to him. They were convicted of their sin too, like that woman. And she stayed for pardon and absolution. No wonder they accused our Lord always of associating with those awful people for whom he came to die. What a pity that those Pharisees knew nothing about the Oedipus complex. Then they could have said they were not guilty. What surprises there will be on the last day when the awful people are come into the kingdom of heaven. And if we get there, we're going to be surprised, first of all, because we're going to see a number of people there and we never expected. And we'll say, how did he get in? <laughs> Glory be to God, look at her. <laughs> and then we're also going to be surprised to find the number of people whom we expected to be there, those nice people, may not be there at all. But those surprises are mild. The third surprise will be the greatest of all. And that surprise is that we are there. <laughs> People of all faiths recognize Bishop Fulton J. Sheen as one of the greatest communicators of the 20th century. He was born in El Paso, Illinois in May of 1896. As a young boy, he knew he wanted to be a priest. He served as an altar boy at St. Mary's Cathedral in Peoria, Illinois. At St. Viator College, his education and debating skills taught him the skills he used throughout his life. His unique ability at being natural and at ease in front of any audience was noted early in his ministry. He was ordained in 1919 and went on to become one of the best-known and greatly loved priests in church history. He wrote 96 books and hundreds of articles and columns. He broadcast numerous radio and TV programs. People from all faiths watched him on television because he spoke to every man. They always waited with joy for his goodbye, his blessing, God love you. It continues to give us joy and memories. Bye now, and God love you. Bishop Fulton J. Sheen went to be with the Lord in December of 1979. Fulton J. Sheen, requiescat in pace. <laughs> Thank you.